Okay. So a little bit about me, so I did my, my PhD work at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, I grew up in the Valley, so I went to Tucson for school, moved out to Biotech Beach, as we call it, in uh, Southern California in San Diego. I was there for a few years, and then I got recruited. Uh, we wanted to come back to Arizona. My wife and I started having kids. We're from Arizona. We wanted to be close to family. Got recruited to Flagstaff to go work for a company called Gore. <coughs> W.L. Gorn Associates here in town. I worked there for about five years. So in total, I was about 10 years in uh, to industry, and then I retired, essentially. And I decided I wanted to come be a teacher again, and I miss teaching. So I came, and my first class that I taught, we don't even offer it anymore. It was biology for non-majors. And so it was like people that thought biology was dumb, um, or there was dumb in the, in the sentence, and I'm not sure where it fit, but they thought biology was dumb. And they didn't want to do anything with biology other than it was a requirement. So that was my first classroom back at NAU. And I was teaching alongside grad students, and people were like, what are you doing here? Um, I said, well, I used to work at Gore, and now I'm here <coughs> teaching next, alongside grad students. And that was 10 years ago, actually 11 years ago. So that was like 2007, 2008. And from there, I started teaching in the lectures again, and now they're fading me out of the classroom, they being the university. Um, I'll tell you why here in a second. So a lot of teaching in my, in my past over the last decade here at the university, about three years, my commitment at the university changed, and I set up an, ac an academic research lab on campus. And um, that has gone really well. We have lots of funding and um, lots of students. And so the way the academic world works is you have 100% of your pie, 
and you divide it up between research, teaching, and service. And so as the research goes up, the teaching has to come down. Does that make sense? Um, about 11 years ago when I started teaching again, I started uh, a biomedical consulting business. Um, and I was doing teaching at the university and I was doing a lot of industry work on my own. Um, and that grew. And even when I switched over into um, an academic research lab, I kept the businesses going. They became businesses over the decade. And so they still run in the background. Um, so I have one foot in industry still um, on company side of things, and then have another foot here in academics, okay? So it's a little unusual. Um, I'm very odd. Um, I've always known that. My mom said that I was very special when I was growing up. <laughs> now I know what she meant. Um, and uh, really my passion here at the university is you all. It's, it's student interaction, okay? Even though I do a lot more research now, um, there's tons of students that are involved in my lab, and that's where I get my sort of student, you know, um, filling up my cup type of thing. So I really am here because I want to be here. And the reason I say all that is um, it would be very easy for me to say I'm not teaching at all but that's not something that I want. And so I made a commitment to this class, to this semester, and I'm hoping you're gonna make the same level of commitment. There's lots of other things that both of us could do. Uh, we all know that. And so when you're here, you're gonna have my undivided attention, and the only person that can interrupt me during a lecture is my wife, okay? Because we have four children, and so if, it's, if she knows when I'm lecturing, so if she calls or texts me, it's probably because there's an emergency, so I have to. And I know that's probably going to be the case for you, too. Some of you have families, okay? You have spouses, you have significant others. Um, you might have kids. Some of you do have kids. I know for a fact you're in this classroom. So if that's the case, I get it. Just try to excuse yourself quietly and not be a disruption, okay? It'll be pretty obvious if I have to excuse myself. But for you, you can just kind of slip out the back. I get it, okay? But other than that, I'm not going to be shopping on Amazon. I'm not going to check my email. I'm not going to be texting my friends. So I'm gonna ask you guys not to do that as well, okay? Um, you might think it's not a big deal, but we're packed in here, and the person that sits in front of you, in the row in front of you, if they're on Amazon or they're watching their favorite version of Netflix, um, it might be a huge distraction for you. So let's try to be considerate of each other um, and extend that courtesy to the whole classroom. Is that cool? So, Put your cell phones away or on vibrate or turn them off if you've got a super loud vibrate, okay? Um, and we're gonna be together for the next two hours. Uh, any questions so far? Why am I in a tie? Because nobody's gonna ask that question. There you go. I took the time to look good in front of you, right? I take it seriously. I've always worn a tie when I when I lecture. It's just sort of my thing. It started a long time ago when I was a lot younger. And I was up at the lecture and, and the students were gathering on the first day of class and people came up and said, so when is the professor getting here? Uh, I don't know, that, that goober's late all the time. And then we just launched into it. And, and I know I don't get that question anymore, but um, the tie kind of stuck. So it helps me get into that game mode know that this is where I'm supposed to be and I'm supposed to be present in front of you for the next two hours. Okay, so that's why I do it. Um, my kids were shocked because if you see me around campus and come to office hours, you may not see me like this, most likely. Okay, even when I go on business trips, I don't put a tie on. <laughs> so I'll put a jacket on, no tie. It's a little restricting around the, around the throat. But um, yeah, it just helps me kind of get in that zone and hopefully um, you guys see that there's a level of commitment, okay? Um, and it, it's really a contract and that's what the syllabus is. is contract between you and I. We're going to go through some of those things. Okay? I record all my lectures. They're live. They're unedited. I make a blooper. You make a blooper. It's there for the world to see. Okay? But I find that helpful. Um, it was your predecessors that asked me to do that because it was valuable in their minds. They saw the value in, in exam time because I only write exam questions over the content and the material we cover in lecture. That's it. There'll be a huge funnel of information. We'll start broad and we'll kind of narrow it down. By the time we get to lecture, it's very focused. And that's what I feel is the most fair to test you on. 
That's my philosophy. I know other classes might think differently. But you'll have a lot of exposure to a broad base of general pathology, and then we're going to go on to some very specific details, and that's what I build my test questions on. So there's a test question. This was always my pet peeve in college. You know, the, the professor would never get through it because they didn't have enough time. And they said, we didn't have enough time, but pages 150 to 450, read them. <laughs> there will be testable material. So you're like, oh, great. So there's like 300 pages of text that I have to read, digest myself. So glad I'm paying you to lecture. Um, thanks very much. So I always kind of made a commitment that if I was ever in that spot, I would test you on what we cover in class. I feel like that's the most fair way to do it. I've been doing it for a long time that way. Students seem to like it that way. How, that, however, I've been doing it a long time. So I think, and now I understand how many professors get, I think I told you this, but it was actually last year I said that, or in 2016, or 15, or 14, or 2010, okay? Um, so I can look at the lectures and say, yes, I did cover that in its entirety. We have a record of what I covered. If there's a test question that thinks unfair, we can go back and we can find out, yeah, you didn't really cover it that way, or you completely skipped it, or I guess I missed that name. Okay, so it goes both ways, so that's why it's there. Um, but it's not just a document, it's, this isn't a courtroom, um, although it might feel like that with a tie in front of you. But it's a valuable study tool, because you can go back and listen to those lectures again, and review them, okay? Any questions on that? Nothing fancy, it's an iPad on a stool, okay? So it's really not that complicated. A lot of my colleagues say, well, golly, that's a lot of work, how do you do this? Lectures and post them like, dude, a monkey could do this. It's not that complicated. Okay? That's the reason for the mic. For two hours of lecture, my voice will drop, uh, and I want it to be up so that in high volume, so we get the audio recording as best as possible. You'll have to turn up your, your headphones if you're listening, but hopefully it'll be a little bit better with the mic in place. Okay, let's transition to the syllabus. Okay? I know, every, every class, it's not gonna be syllabus and then see you later, see you in two weeks. We're gonna go through some content. But I wanna give you the mechanics of the class, okay? So I have office hours on Monday from 10 to 11 or by appointment. I'll tell you right now, typically Wednesday and Thursday I'm out of town every week, okay? So one of my companies, is in, we have a plant in Phoenix, manufacturing plant in Phoenix, so I go there every Wednesday, Thursday. This week is tomorrow but that's a little unusual. So Monday's gonna be the best day to catch me. Monday's, potentially Monday's, Tuesday's, or Friday's. Those are gonna be the three days of the week that's the best to catch me. Email, I'm usually pretty good about responding on email. Okay, I usually try to get back to you within a 24 hour period. If you leave me a voicemail, that's the worst way to reach me, mm -hmm. but it will go to my email and I'll listen to it and I'll try to call you back or I might just send you an email, okay? The um, class is listed there, we'll go the full time. It's three hours. The required text is a pathology book. It's gonna be valuable to have that. You're gonna have pre-quizzes and post-quizzes every week, except for this week. And next week, okay? Um, it's your responsibility to remember when those are. The first couple of weeks of the semester, I'll probably send out some reminders. Did everybody get the BB Learn announcement today? I think it went down at some point today, like I think it crashed. Like that in parking services, I think crashed today. Right? Some of you are like, yeah, I bought a pass. And, did anybody buy a pass and there's no spots? Okay. No? Okay, good. Well, that worked that out really well. All of you just got tickets on your car right now. Okay. Um, so BB Learn announcements will push out notifications like on SI times. You're like, what, SI? Yeah, we have an SI in this class. A little background here in a second. Um, if I'm going to modify my office hours, sometimes things come up, okay? If I'm going to add office hours, sometimes I will do that because I feel like the SI and I will get together and I feel like there's a general feeling of malaise in the classroom and maybe some office hours that are additional would be valuable, okay? Um, it's very unusual to cancel class, but if we do have to cancel class, there is a video recording of me a year younger, okay? I'm better last year than I was this year, okay? So the content will go on, all right? So don't, don't, fret, don't fret. If you, you're big men and women now, you're grown-ups, okay? 
So if you have to be away for a conference, if you have something come up, I get it, okay? You're gonna really have a tough time doing well in the exam if you don't come to class. But if you have to miss, you can go to that video recording. It usually takes me a day or maybe two days and, and the new YouTube recording will be there and you can watch that video recording, okay? But again, you can review as many times as you want before the exam. The textbook is either the eighth or the ninth edition, okay? Um, either will work. You're gonna need that for your pre-quizzes and your post-quizzes. They're open book, open notes. Some of the questions are more broad in nature. Stuff that we don't cover in class. That's actually somewhat intentional. Especially the post-quizzes. The post-quizzes, because you can Google it, you can look it up in the textbook, there's gonna be stuff that we didn't cover. So I don't want to hear the feedback of, well, we didn't cover that in class. Why are you testing on it? I'm explaining why. I want you to be exposed to it. On the actual exam, I won't ask those questions. But on the quizzes, it's fair, especially if you can look it up. You're moving into a whole new realm, okay, of professionalism, and that is, there's so much information at your fingertips. It's not about finding the answer, it's about sifting through what's good data and what's bad data, okay? So now, your healthcare provider, they're Googling stuff when they leave your room. You know they are, right? A lot of my colleagues are surgeons and physicians, and like, yeah, I, I GTS that all the time, right? Google that stuff. <laughs> I Google that all the time. I just don't do it in the room with the patient, because they're like, So it's not about, can you find the information, it's about sifting through what's good information and what's poor information, okay? So that's the reason for the pre and the post quiz, is I want you to be able to find that information quickly and be able to sift through where are the good sources and where are the bad sources. Your textbook is a great source, but it's not the only source. Um, there's the online lectures, there's the, the link. Um, then there's a optional DVD histology that's in the bookstore. You don't absolutely have to have that. Uh, all of the histology that's on the exams, we will have covered in class. You'll have seen it before. All the gross pathology or all the histology images that you'll be tested on in, in, in the exams will cover on the screen. Okay? Yes, in the back. Do you post those also? What's that? Do you post like the, the, the pictures and the uh, PowerPoints online? Yeah, the PowerPoints are already listed. I'll show you where they are. Yep, everything's listed. All the lectures for the whole class are <laughs> um, then there's another book here. This is a pathophysiology book. This is actually a, a medical school pathophysiology text. Um, may actually be valuable for the grad students or students that want to take this class for honors. It is honors eligible. So grad students and honors students, you're going to want to see me after class or send me an email. We'll talk about some of those requirements. They're a little different. Okay, you have an extra term paper that you have to write and your exams are separate exams different exams, okay? Um, one of the most important pieces on the syllabus, and So this is probably the most important stuff on the syllabus, uh, how the point totals are gonna look for the semester. So this is in the syllabus. Is this not working? Okay, here we go. So we've got two exams and one final. They're all cumulative, so it's really more like three exams. They're all 100 points, there's 300 points. But wait, there's more. Um, there's 12 online pre-quizzes and there's 12 online post-quizzes. And the lowest score will be dropped of each of those. I get it, you go out of town for a concert, you go out of town to ski, you go out of town to see mom or dad or your boyfriend or girlfriend, and you forget to hit those deadlines to get one freebie each time, that's it, okay? But this gives you a total of 520 points it's a straight scale with standard math rounding. 89.5 and up is a A. 79.5 up to 89.49 <coughs> is a B. So on and so forth. Those two categories will typically capture about 85%, 90% of the class. Right there, that's the kind of students that take this class, okay? But 
every semester it never fails, in this classroom there are some borderline students when everything's said and done, okay? There's no extra credit. There's nothing else outside of these 520 points and it's a straight scale. It's another thing that I said when I was in your seats is I want to know what the expectation is and know what I have to do to get the grade that I want to earn, okay? Notice the words that I said very carefully there. I know what I have to do to get the grade that I have earned, right? I don't hand out grades. I just assign grades to students who have earned those grades. Does that make sense? So at the end of the semester, if I get an email from you, if you come to my office hours and you say, hey, I'm borderline, I have an 89.4, Seven. I am so close. I came to class every time I sat in the front row, okay? I brought you fresh baked cookies. I complimented your tie, okay? Is there anything else that I can do? What is the fairest answer to that student? I'm sorry, right? Usually you should start out with I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry, okay? In sensitivity training, they tell you that. It's gonna be no, start out with like, I'm sorry, okay? But we both know what the specific cutoff ranges were. It was that on day one, it's gonna be that on the last day of class, okay? If a hundred of you get an A, fantastic, okay? I don't need to curve the class down, that's not my job. My job is try to present the information in a way that you can actually learn it. But it's your job also to learn it, right? It's, it's a partnership. So this is, the, this is what the expectations are and we're gonna have this throughout the entire semester, okay? What you will find is I'll be happy to sit down with you and calculate where you fall. And we can do the little what ifs. What if I get this on the final? What if I get this on the last quizzes, the last two quizzes? Am I going to potentially be able to get a B or an A? We can do all those calculations or those exercises and calculators together, no problem, okay? But it's, it's, I've discovered that it's really nice and it takes away a lot of the anxiety if you know what's expected of you from day one, and you're not worried about what's this weird curve gonna look like by this guy, right? Okay, so that's that's how this class works. I do not take attendance. I tell, I'm telling you, if you don't come, you're not gonna do well. Um, you can challenge tricky questions. Okay, those of you that um, are future physicians, raise your hand again. So, let's see, gentleman here, San Diego Padres, and a uh, woman back here on the, on the edge with the ripped jeans. Okay, yeah. Okay, stand up. What are your names, Dr. Cole Titus? Dr. Cole Titus? Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, Dr. Titus and Dr. Smith. They can take a look at each other, you colleagues. I'm your patient, okay? This could be real someday, right? And I'm old and decrepit, and I come to see you for a condition. Okay, do you think, look at each other, do you think you both, if I saw Dr. Smith first and then I went to see Dr. Titus, do you think they're always gonna agree about what I have and what should be done? No. no? So how are you guys gonna have that conversation? And I'm, I really care about this because this is about me. So how are you gonna talk to each other about how to treat your patient, right? Look at each other, how are you gonna have that conversation? <laughs> just gonna stare at each other? Okay. Are you gonna yell at each other? Are you gonna say that, um, you know, I disagree, you're an idiot? No, you're gonna to approach this in a professional <coughs> way, right? What if you have a diagnosis that Dr. Smith doesn't agree with? How would you handle that? What would you say? Start with that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no idea? Anybody else wanna help out? Some future nurses in the room. Future nurses in the room, because that's part of the medical community. So nurse practitioners, come on, stand up. A nurse practitioner's gonna come beside one of your colleagues and help out, disagreeing with Dr. Titus's uh, diagnosis, and you work with Dr. Smith. How are you gonna, how are you gonna handle that? Right here. Me? Yes, you, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, Go ahead and stand up. You also have ripped jeans on, okay. <laughs> I can see everybody's kneecaps, that's why I can tell. <laughs> Go from there, ask why they think the way they do. Go from there. What else, what else, right here? Stand up, you stand up, you stand up. We're all part of this team together, stay standing. Yep. I know, it's super uncomfortable, isn't it? Wait, 
Try putting a tie on and watch how warm it is. <laughs> explain their situation and then maybe explain your situation. Let's give them a round of applause. So the idea here is this is your future profession is you are not going to be working in an environment where you agree with everybody. Okay? And you're in an environment where you may not agree with me. And, and that's okay. But there's going to be a professional way to come forward and say, I don't think that was a fair question. Or I think it was um, maybe I don't understand the answer, why the answer to that question was, was what it was. And I actually found information that might suggest that another answer was correct. Okay? Instead of that was a bogus question, Keller. That was tricky, right? That was a tricky question. That was unfair. Okay? It's unfair that you came up with that diagnosis. I don't agree with you, right? You sound like a horrible whiny baby, right? <laughs> but if, if you present your case of, you know, I've had the experience of this, or here's what I found, I'd like to see what you found to lead you to that answer. That's how we should, and if you don't practice that, and we don't create an environment where you can practice that, you're not gonna get good at it, okay? So I want you to come to me and say, yeah, I, I think that I missed that question because I didn't understand it. I was hoping you could explain to me what the answer is, because I came up with a different answer, and I might have some information. I might be right, I might be wrong, but I kind of want to just have some dialogue. That's a really good way to, to challenge a tricky question. You should try that in another class of yours. Instead of saying, hey, Dr. So-and-so, that was a tricky question, just see what happens when you approach it in a professional manner, okay? So we're gonna practice that. And we'll, in a class of 100, I'm not perfect. I'm gonna write some terrible questions. I'm gonna make a mistake, okay? And you all are gonna point it out to me, like a lot of students do. But there's a great way to do it, and then there's a not so great way to do it, okay? All right, now, this is kind of the yucky stuff that we gotta go through. And to be honest, in this class, and in other classes I've had, I've had to deal with this a lot more, in this class, not as much, because at this point, you know, you guys have heard the saying, I mean, your true character is really who you are when nobody's watching. <coughs> That's who, that's who you really are, okay? So the way that you behave when you know no one's paying attention or no one's gonna see you, I mean, that's really what defines who you really are. And so if you're gonna be future physicians, right, you're gonna be future nurses, scientists, right? Scientists have retractions in publications all the time, unfortunately, because somebody discovered that they falsify data, okay? So don't be that kind of professional. I mean, it starts right here in the classroom. Right? The university takes these very seriously, Plagiarism, cheating, fabrication, fraud, we're required to go over these things. But again, my plea to you is practice being a professional now in this classroom because you're gonna carry these things forward into your professional life. There's no question about that. All right, so here is our schedule for the semester. It's all planned out. You can see we don't have Labor Day, um, we don't have class. We do have Labor Day, we don't have class on Labor Day. And so therefore we've accounted for a week off because I figured you guys would need a break after this week. Okay? I did it, that's just the way the schedule works out. But you can see every week we're gonna have a pre-quiz and a post-quiz. The pre-quizzes are due before you come to class. They're online, I'll show you where to go. You gotta finish those before they turn off at noon. Then we have class at 12.45. And the point there is I want you guys to become familiar with the material. And then the post quizzes are due by Friday evening at 11.59 p.m., like before you go out for dinner, okay? Um, you can take these at any time, they're open now. So if you know you're gonna be gone for Thanksgiving week and you're worried about that quiz on Black Friday because you're gonna be shopping, you can take that quiz before you leave. You can take it next week, okay? You only get one time, they're not quizzes for mastery, okay? I mean, if you have to repair, um, you know, a fractured bone or if you have to do a heart transplant, you don't get to do it until it goes right, okay? 
okay? So life is not, you know, for mastery. It's sometimes you just get one chance, okay? So that's not a bad practice to get into, is you just have one chance at these, these quizzes. They're timed at 30 minutes. They're easy to get through, but they're even easier to get through is if you've already done the reading and you already know where to look up some of the answers, okay? The post quizzes are a lot easier to get through if you have all of that information, plus you went to the lecture, okay? So again, this is kind of putting some structure into place for the semester so that we force you to spend time with the material before the exam. Back in the dinosaur ages, we called that study. Now we have to rename everything. So. Yeah. Okay, just, just to reiterate, pre quiz is due by noon and four quiz by midnight? Essentially midnight. I think it says 11.59 yeah. p.m. on Friday. Yep. That is correct. Everybody hear that? Uh, so you can see the schedule. Uh, this one's already highlighted. I'm going to be at a conference this week, so I won't be here, but you're, everything will happen as normal. You'll just see a younger, better looking version of me on the screen, okay? From last year. Here's um, the exam one. You can see we have another week off with Veterans Day, for crying out loud. Um, the week of Thanksgiving, uh, we have Monday class, so we will have class that day, okay? Um, some of you have already emailed me about final exam schedule and about what we're doing on Thanksgiving because you're, you're planning flights. So hopefully you've got the information that you need, but um, Here's our final right here. This is according to the published final exam schedule. So technically, if every teacher is following the schedule, it shouldn't have any conflicts. Again, there's a huge caveat there. So this is according to the published final exam schedule. Wednesday, December 12th, from 12.30 to 2.30, it'll be in this room. So you can schedule your flight home um, appropriately. Okay? If you know you're going to have a conflict, I would suggest you talk with that other classroom, especially if it's a smaller class than this one, and see if there's an alternate time that you can make the exam. If not, I will figure out another provision for you, okay? If you have a conflict for final exam schedule. According to the um, university policies, if you have three final exams on the same day, you technically can get one of them rescheduled. Again, I would ask that you talk to another class first that might be a smaller classroom. And the only reason I say that is it's harder to deal with rescheduling larger classroom finals. So if you got a classroom that's smaller than this one, start there. If this is your smallest class, then we'll start here, okay? Questions about that? How are your exams um, structured in case? Yeah, we'll talk more about the exams that closer to the first exam, but they're all multiple choice for the undergrads. The um, um, honor students as well as the grad students have a essay portion or a free response portion, okay? Um, but there, you have two hours to complete the exam. Most students get it done within an hour. You have plenty of time. Yes? Are they online or are they free? No, they're right here in this classroom, yep. All right, let's, um, everybody get a chance to take a look at any of this? They're just kind of fun brain teasers. Anybody got a box that they know what, what it translates to? Shout out the number and tell us what it is. Yeah, in the back. Is the first one history repeats? History repeats itself, yep. Okay, number two. <coughs>
So, what do I need? I kind of went through some of this stuff. You, you need a textbook, okay? You can decide if you need a legacy class or not, okay? The first chapter um, for cell injury is posted in the BB Learn Show, okay? If you haven't bought your textbook yet. So, if you're like, oh, if my student loan money's coming in and you need a couple of weeks, you actually have a couple of weeks because you don't have class next week. So, chapter one, PDF is already in. Um, in the BB Learn Show. Okay, so you're allowed to provide the students for free access to a textbook as long as it's less than 10%. So that's why we can do that. But I can't put the whole book online for free. I mean, that, you know, that would be you're under arrest. Okay. <laughs> so the traditional class format, okay? There's not much preparation before you get here, kind of like today. The first time that you hear the material or expose the material is in this classroom. You walk away with lots of questions. You're not really certain about what the material is. This has a foreign language component built into it. We have a lot of the terminology is Latin, or Latin based. And then, really, you have a lot of unsuccessful exam um, preparation, where this hybrid version, so we called it hybrid before uh, blended and online and all this stuff. This is dating back like almost a decade ago. But really, the, all of these different alternative styles of education are trying to figure out how to improve student success. And the way that we do that is we actually force you, okay, to spend time with material before you show up. That's why you have a pre-quiz. And I've had all sorts of different modalities of pre-class work over the years, and the pre-quiz has been really the most successful. All right, 30 minutes, it doesn't take long to do. Okay, it's an online format. You can do it from a coffee shop. Okay, uh, but you got to spend time with material. If you miss five out of five questions, you still know what those questions were, and you might go look them up before you show up here. You at least know the topic that we're talking about. Okay, we're not going to be talking about the election that's coming up. Okay, we're not going to be talking about um, anything within politics or talking about the weather. We're going to be talking about certain key concepts within pathology. And then um, me with a horrible looking suit is going to show you the second exposure of the content. And so at least you're going to be familiar with some of these terminologies, like the word apoptosis, for example, in two weeks. All right, so apoptosis, program cell death. You'll know a little bit about it. You'll know that that's what we're talking about. You've probably heard it before in another class. You're going to know, oh, I can recall it. I'll go look maybe at my old class notes. And you took a pre-quiz on it. Maybe you got that question right. So now you're gonna be more engaged in the classroom lecture because you know what, you're following what we're speaking about. You're not just blah, 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 right? And then in the out of class, and this is where the SI comes in, and I'm gonna introduce Karen here right after this slide to talk about her background in SI time, okay? But the SI, I wanna give you a little cue on the SI. This is the out of class experience. Is it a requirement? Well, technically not. It is for Karen, okay? And I think you'd be foolish to not consider it a requirement because we're the only 300 level class or upper division class on campus that had an SI. So we had a dedicated SI for years because your predecessors wanted better exam performance and said in your course reviews, I really would like an SI for this class. An SI in this class would be valuable. And I went to that a number of semesters in a row in fact, I even took some of my student feedback from my reviews that, that wrote, uh, how could I make this class better? Dr. Keller, I like the class, but if you could add an SI, it would be even better. And I took those and I used that as ammunition to get an SI, and students have been using it and doing well in the class and better in the class, and that's why we kept the resource, okay? So, you'd be foolish not to use it. It's a key concept for the philosophy of how this classroom runs, and I get it that you're all busy. All of us are busy. In fact, just, I'm entering into that age where I can start to be a little grumpy and start to get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't wait until I'm really old and then I can just be always grumpy and people are like, ah, he's just a grumpy old man. <laughs> but my least favorite excuse is I'm busy, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry I just got busy. I'm too busy, okay? Everybody is busy. If it's gonna be a priority to you, doesn't matter how busy you are, you will make time for it, okay? So, if you want to get an A or B in this class, you're gonna to have to make time for it. And it's 
it's gonna have to be a priority. And I know that you're busy. I know that you save children out of the street and that you donate to the Angel Fund and you're volunteering at the hospital and you have a full-time job and, 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 and. And I get that because that's what the demographic of this classroom always is. Some amazing citizens in this classroom. But you're gonna have to figure out how am I gonna carve out the time to be successful in this class, okay? And the SI, and Taryn's gonna come up here, let her introduce herself. She is part of that key to your success. And then the last thing is Taryn comes up, come on up Taryn. The last thing I'm gonna say is, after the first exam, I inevitably get more students in my office hours, or scheduling office hours, and I get this question, Dr. Keller, I didn't do as well as I wanted to on the exam. What else could I do in this class to improve my learning? And I'm gonna ask you, are you going to SI? And if you truly say yes, then we'll have more conversations. But a lot of times, students say, no, I'm not, because I'm too busy, because I work full time, because of this, because of this. And I'll say, well, remember the first day of class when I told you there are some focused energies around SI time. Now is the time to move your schedule around so that you can attend SI every week so that you can have that performance that you want because that'll be the first thing that I'm gonna tell you to do after the first exam. I'm just gonna, I've done this a lot. I know that'll be a conversation that we'll have and this is where I'll point to and we'll have a video record that I told you so, right? Okay, Taryn.
lot of times. Four to five on Wednesdays. Okay, and then Thursdays, 10 to 11. Okay, what about one to two on Thursdays? breakout little group conversations or little activities. It's harder to do, you know, hey, get groups of three. You know, there's like 33 groups. I mean, it doesn't work really well in a lecture style classroom that's this big. But we will have conversations. You guys will get to know each other, maybe sitting around each other. And those of you that go to SI will obviously have that time, okay? So let's take a little five minute break, okay? Stretch your legs. You can check your messages if you need to. Okay, and then I'm going to show you the BB Learn shells where the quizzes are. Okay. 